introduction and presentation of more today um, to uh, share with you our views on the Ohio answer um, and how uh, our strategies have been developed to uh, approach this, uh, this disease. I'll give you some background information about the concepts and then I'm going to give you specific uh, examples uh, on our attempt to manage um, brain cancer. Alright, so um, I like to start my presentations with kind of a report card. This is, these are data from the American Cancer Society and they're compiled uh, over the last five years and I've been doing this now for quite a number of years but as you can see, um, what we have here over the last from 2013 to 2017, uh, new cases, deaths per year, deaths per day. And if you look at the numbers carefully, you see that it's quite sobering. Uh, in the United States, we have over 1,600 people a day dying from cancer. Um, and you'll notice the rate of increases in, in deaths are, uh, are a little bit greater than that of even the, the, the numbers of new cases per year. So um, and every year, the American Cancer Society comes out with their uh, annual report on where we stand. And they always seem to think we're doing really well. Uh, I don't see that. And then, and then we say to ourselves, um, well, listen, you know, we raise massive amounts of money for cancer research. We have organizations, whether it's the federal government or whether it's the pharmaceutical industries or whether it's the private foundations. Everyone is out jumping, running, painting pink ribbons and doing this and not doing that. Raise money, do this, do that. Where do all that money going? Everybody asks what's going on with all this money that we raise for cancer. Cancer research, right? The more money we raise for cancer research, the more cancer we get. And this is just established year in and year out. What is, where is the accountability? Does anyone ask what you do with all this money? If they give you all this money, how come you don't do anything about reducing these death rates? They certainly did that with the AIDS, dropped real quick once they did not kill not cancer. So what's underlying this? What's underlying this is a fundamental misunderstanding of what the nature of the disease is. So right now we're focused almost entirely on Nuclear gene mutations. The nucleus of the cell is where most of the focus is, is, is. But we also know the mitochondria of the cell are damaged as well. These are the energy generating organelles within the cell. They're damaged. And what I'm going to present the to data today is that it's the mitochondrial damage that's largely responsible for the origin of the disease. And the nuclear mutations are largely downstream epiphenomena. They're effects, they're not causes. So we have actually focused on the wrong thing for all these years. And in my mind, this accounts for the disastrous situation we have worldwide for this disease. So, we look at cancer today, the current dogmatic view is that it's a genetic disease. And this has been solidified in a number of primary uh, papers published in the literature. This is just one, the hallmarks of cancer by Henning and Weinberg. Cancer cells carry the, gen the uh, oncogenic and tumor suppressor mutations that define cancer as a genetic disease. Um, this is a dogmatic view, so it's a, a dogmatic, so it's a, an idea that's no longer challenged, to accepted uh, religiously by the members of the, of the field. Um, we know it's a dogmatic view because if you look at any textbook of biology, cell biology, or biochemistry, cancer is a genetic disease. You go to the National Institutes of, of Health uh, NIH website, and you'll see cancer is a genetic disease. There's no discussion. That's the way it is. That's the, the, this is it. It's, it's a solidified. This dogmatic view has now indoctrinated several generations of physicians and scientists into this worldview. It's not so we were focusing on cancer as a genetic disease. And the somatic mutation theory is the bedrock upon which the genetic disease is based. And you use these little images that you see in textbooks, um, a car with no brakes, speeding out of control, to represent what cancer cells are. Essentially, the phenotype of cancer is the cell division out of control. And uh, in the molecular view, this is due to mutations in oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, right? So the, the tumor suppressor genes prevent the cells from stopping their growth. The oncogenes stimulate their growth. And this is the way we convey the message to the next generation and the next groups of people. So we have somatic mutation theory. This is the, the bedrock. This means that we have uh, random mutations cause cancer, all right? This is the, 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 the dogmatic view. This is um, have the, the normal cell. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe a hundred million, I don't know. 
Nobody really knows for sure how many mutations it takes to form a tumor cell. Um, and as you said, in the quote here from Vogelstein's group, you know, we know now uh, precisely what causes cancer, a sequential series of alterations in well-defined driver genes. Um, what about those uh, normal cells in our body that have driver gene mutations and never form cancer? What about the cancers that have no mutations? These, these things are, are, are rarely if ever discussed. So we have a lot of issues that um, I will present even more uh, uh, data to, to, to reject this whole worldview. Um, now where we are today, as the result of all of this, is this, this personalized medicine, personalized therapies, precision medicine, you've heard people talk about this. This is based on the gene theory of cancer. So in this particular image here, we have this woman staring into a screen. She's looking uh, to see if, they, if breast cancer cells uh, might have some uh, uh, altered gene product that could be used for diagnosis or, or therapy. Um, now, how do you get that information? You need needle biopsy, right? So you take a needle biopsy of the tissue, and then you take a readout of the, of the genetic profile. $7,200 to do one of these complete profiles in the United States. And um, by taking a needle biopsy, you create a phenomenon called an inflammatory oncotaxis. People don't realize this, but you put those patients at risk for spreading the cancer by the very act of taking the tissue. It doesn't happen in a lot of people, but there's enough articles in the scientific literature saying that inflammatory oncotaxis can put patients at risk for spreading their disease simply so you can get a readout of what the nature of that disease is. And that would all be important if these gene mutations were in fact important for the, for the, for the understanding of the disease, but they're largely irrelevant. So, uh, uh, so the very act of doing this could put patients at risk, but the information gain is relatively minimal. So, this evidence challenging the somatic mutation theory of cancer. It challenges the dogmatic theory. And whenever anyone challenges a dogma, I don't care if it's a religion or political affiliation or whatever, you, you get people that don't want to look at the information, they don't want to talk, and they don't want to do it. It's just uh, typical. Well, let's look at some of the data. This was a beautiful study done by McKinnell uh, uh, and his group uh, with a very a, a, a vigorous growth of a, of a kidney cancer in the frog, the lung frog. It was a very lethal uh, renal type of cancer. And they did some the very beautiful developmental work on this. They, they took and isolated the individual cells that contained the oncogenes and the tumor suppressor genes that ended up driving the disease as the dogmatic view would state. They took the nucleus out of this raging tumor and they put the nucleus into a, a, a fertilized, the e nucleated fertilized egg. So you can see there the dark nucleus in the new cytoplasm containing new mitochondria. And then they developed a tadpole from this new cancer nucleus developed a tadpole. The tadpole was normal in every way. They looked at it in so many different ways, beautiful paper in science. There was no disorganized cell growth. The problem was that tadpole was unable to develop into a mature frog. So there was some aspect of the mutations or defects in that nucleus that block development, but it didn't form this regulated cell growth. These findings are inconsistent with the somatic mutation theory. This was work done by Rudy Adich and his colleagues at MIT, and where he, uh, he uh, did some really nice work on a variety of different genetic uh, cancers. And he took melanoma cells, uh, a, a aggressive malignant melanoma, I analyzed the genetic mutations in the melanoma nucleus and the melanoma before he, he took the nucleus and made uh, uh, into stem cells and clone a, a, a mouse, this is a mouse embryo, clone from the nucleus of a melanoma. And you can see what he says in the presence of major genetic abnormalities in the embryonic mice cloned from the tumor nuclei, right? Unequivocal genomic evidence that the mice were cloned from the tumor nucleus without any dysregulated cell growth. But like the frog, these uh, mice could not further develop. So the mutations in the nucleus were blocking development. They were not causing the signature feature of the disease, which is dysregulated cell growth. Not consistent with somatic mutation theory. This was another study that was done at Baylor College of Medicine by Dr. Wong and her group, where they transferred mitochondria from cancer cells into normal cells and mitochondria from normal cells into cancer cells. It was very interesting because they showed that the oncogenes were raging in the very highly metastatic breast cancer cells showing them very active like you would normally expect to find. And when normal mitochondria were put into the cytoplasm of these metastatic breast cancers, oncogenes turned off and the cells became growth regulated. Very interesting. And when they did the opposite experiment, where they took the mitochondria from the raging male, uh, breast cancer cells and put them into the cytoplasm of a very indolent cell, the indolent cells now became uh, malignant and, and growth dysregulated. <coughs> Clearly showing that it was the mitochondria that were driving the, 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 the 
phenotype, not the nucleus. So what I did, and, and this is an extension of a chapter in my book, chapter 13, I wrote a paper uh, published in Open Access Frontiers, uh, right? Now, what I, I can't, I don't have time to go through all these, the dozens and dozens of experiments. All I did was bundle, I went through the literature, and I bundled up all those kinds of experiments that were inconsistent with the somatic mutation theory, and just put them all together for the first time, and have the reader go through this experiment, that experiment, this experiment, comparing the results on two different fundamental explanations for the origin of the disease, right? Is it a genetic disease, or is it a mitochondrial metabolic disease? And I think anyone who has a rational thinking will come to the conclusion that this is a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And we put this, uh, my students and I put this figure together to kind of summarize the vast majority of, of findings that were done. And this, this pretty much shows that we have the green cells, the normal cells. Normal cells beget other normal cells. And then we have cancer cells, which are red, and cancer cells beget other cancer cells or tumor cells. And we know in the tumor cells we have nuclear gene defects, oncogenes and tumor suppressor gene mutations over the nucleus, but we also know the mitochondria are defective in these cells. But we don't know what organelle is really driving the disease. Is it the nucleus? Is it the mitochondria? Is it a combination of both? So when you transfer the red nucleus that has the uh, mutations into a new cytoplasm, which has been repeatedly shown, you get normal cells that are growth regulated, sometimes tissue, sometimes you can clone a frog or a mouse from, from these things without without seeing that there's dysregulated growth. On the other hand, if you take the green nucleus and put it into a red cytoplasm, like uh, Israel and Schaefer did in the 1980s, you get either dead cells or tumor cells. You don't get normal cells, despite the fact that the nucleus that was put into it was originally normal. Now these findings, when, when you look at it like this, undermine the view that cancer is a, might have, is a genetic disease. These are the strongest evidence to date that cancer is not a genetic disease. This is important, all right, because this dictates how we, name, how we view the disease, how we're going to manage the disease. So if cancer, if somatic mutations are not the origin of cancer, how do cancer cells start? What, how do they arise? And as Alison said, you know, Warburg had recognized this some time ago. Cancer arises from damage to the cellular respiration. Energy through fermentation, and I'll talk about this, gradually compensates for insufficient respiration. Cancer cells continue to ferment lactic acid in the presence of oxygen, and what we recently found, and we filled in the missing link in Warburg's theory, they also can ferment amino acids, up, so you have to, we have to recognize that. That was unknown to Warburg that we now know, and can account for a lot of the mysterious or unexplained observations. Enhanced fermentation is the signature metabolic malady of all cancer cells, most of all cancer cells. So listen. If we look at a tumor from one person and another person, we do genetic analysis on these tumors. We find that there's no two people, no two tumors in any, per, in any group of people that are all the same genetically. We know that. As a matter of fact, if we take the cells out of anybody's tumor and clone all the cells and look at them, we find that no two cells in anyone's tumor have the same genetic abnormalities. But all the cells in those tumors are fermented. Now, what do, you, what do you think makes more sense? Do you think we should? Focus our attention on the unique mutations that exist in everyone's individual cells in the tumor? Or do you think it makes more sense to challenge and target the single pathological problem in all the cells? It's a question you should think about. So let's look at energy metabolism. Here we have just an overview. Um, most of the energy in our body comes from respiration, right? We're all breathing, we're all breathing. I don't, I don't see any zombies sitting out here. We all breathe, right? If we don't breathe, we're going to fall over. The, uh, the vast majority of our energy comes from electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. I mean, we know this. This is the biochemistry of the cell. Very little energy comes out of these ancient pathways of substrate level phosphorylations, which occur in the cytoplasm by root rate kinase step and in the mitochondria of the substrate lipase step. You get a little bit of energy from this, but the majority of energy is coming from oxidative phosphorylation. The cancer cell is different. Cancer cells are generating a lot more energy from these ancient pathways of substrate level phosphorylation, and much less energy from oxidative phosphorylation. And that shift from oxphos to these ancient pathways leads to the, the disorganization of the cell and unbridled proliferation. I'll present that to this All right, so there has been a massive amounts of data collected on cancer over the last 50 or 60 years, and even before that. 
We cannot deny the facts. The facts of the disease have been well established. The question is how all those facts link together to, to account for the origin of the disease. And what we have simply done is reconfigured the players in, in, the, in, 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 the, in the field. All right, so on this particular diagram, we now focus our attention on the mitochondria. So you see that over here. And we know uh, what causes cancer. All right, people say, what causes cancer? Can carcinogens, we, heard, we already heard that. Everybody knows this is a cause of cancer. Radiation causes cancer, nobody denies that. Intermittent hypoxia causes cancer, this is all the way. Chronic inflammation causes cancer. Rare inherited mutations, BRCA1, P53, we hear about these, they, they will cause cancer. The RAS oncogene can cause cancer. Viruses can cause cancer. Oncogenic viruses happen on the hepatitis C, there's a whole bunch of these. And the older we get, age, age can contribute to the origin of cancer. The, the problem that was the, the stumbling block was this is the, called the oncogenic paradox. People have known this, but they weren't able to understand for decades how all of these different provocative uh, agents could possibly cause cancer through a common pathophysiological mechanism. What was common to all of these provocative agents? And if you read the book Emperor of All Maladies by Sid Mukherjee, made the New York Times bestseller list and won the Pulitzer Prize for that book, he struggles with this. If you read his book carefully, you will find on page 285 and page 303, struggling with this idea, how do we, how do we uh, uh, arrive at a common pathophysiological mechanism from all this? And it's, we, we put that, we fill in the blank, it's reactive oxygen species. Every one of these provocative agents will damage the respiration, leading to the formation of ROS, R-O-S, reactive oxygen species. ROS are known to be carcinogenic and mutagenic. They will cause DNA mutations. So what we're seeing then is the, any one of these provocative agents will cause cancer, only if it damages the respiration and produces rocks. If it doesn't damage the respiration, like some of the inherited mutations, there are people with P53 mutations who never get cancer, BRCA1 who never get cancer. That will cause cancer only, thing, only if it damages the respiration. If it doesn't damage the respiration, it's not a primary cause, it's a secondary cause. And Warburg was very clear about this. So what happens then is the mitochondria become damaged. And as you can see on the diagram below, uh, the red line begins to replace the green line as the major energy within the cell. So this is a chronic a transformation of energy away from oxphos to substrate level phosphorylation. Because if that transformation cannot be made, the cell will die and never become a cancer cell. So it's a gradual shift of energy from one form to another. And that's what Warburg had, 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 had clearly demonstrated. So the nuclear mutations then come as a downstream epiphenomenon. And in order to, uh, that red line is driven by oncogenes. They are transcription factors to bring in fermentable fuels into the cell. This now becomes very clear. So now we can begin to link the, 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 the classic hallmarks of the disease back to the origin through a mitochondrial uh, abnormality. So the first, the first thing you look at, the, the, the first three uh, Hanahan Weinberg hallmarks are dysregulated cell growth. This comes from the, the, the cell entering its default state. Now, what is the default state? This is the way the cells existed before they became uh, respiratory cells. They fall back on an energy platform that existed before oxygen came into the atmosphere some 2.5 billion years ago. At that point in our Earth's history, all the organisms existed on fermentation metabolism. They would, they would be unbridled proliferation until the fermentable fuels in the environment were dissipated and then the cells would die. These cancer cells are simply falling back on this ancient platform of energy metabolism to fermentation. And doing that, they throw out a lot of uh, uh, un undigested material, like acid and succinic acid, leading the body to think that they're a wound that doesn't heal. So the angiogenic blood vessels come in, explained by the fact that these are fermenting cells. Then they say, well, why do they bypass the apoptosis program cell death, right? Cancer cells, they, they, uh, they, they uh, what do they call it? Uh, evasion, evasion of apoptosis. The organelle that controls the apoptotic signal is the mitochondria. It's the kill switch for the cell, all right? If the kill switch doesn't work, the cell evades apoptosis and they don't want to continue to proliferate. But the big dog here is the metastasis. How do you explain metastasis? Because this is ultimately what happens most of the cancer patients. Either the, either the disease or the drugs used to attempt to manage the disease will kill most of the patients. So, okay, let's look at that. The evidence to support the, the fusion hybrid hypothesis for the metastatic. This is different from the EMT, the transition, which is based on the gene theory, which we now know is undermined. 
So we have to honor our epithelial cells in a particular organ of our body. These cells get damaged from any one of the provocative agents that I mentioned. They start this proliferative uh, cascading. They start to proliferate a little bit more, disturbing the microenvironment, signaling our immune system to come in and say, you know, what's going on? We've got to deal with the environment. The red cells are macrophages. They come in to, to heal wounds. Macrophages are, they throw out growth factors and cytokines. This is in the wrong context, which is like throwing gasoline on the fire, causing these cells to become even more dysmorphic. Macrophages, by the nature of the biology of the refusogenic cells, they facilitate the wound healing by fusing. So what happens is they begin to fuse with each other and with the other cells in the right environment. This has been established by this logical analysis. And what happens is you get a dilution of their cytoplasm. With mitochondria from the, the blue cells, which are disabled mitochondria, and gradually the macrophages also take on this abnormal metabolism. Now, the problem, of course, is the macrophages are already genetically programmed to live in the circulation, intravasate, extravasate. You don't have to have new genes to do this. These guys are already programmed. This is what they do. So now we have one of the most powerful cells in our body, a macrophage, becoming a rogue cell. And we know what these cells are capable of living in hypoxic environments. This is why anti-angiogenic drugs don't work. This has been proven. They're also glutamine hormones. They're very dependent on glutamine. That's a key piece of information for the eventual management of the disease. So we understand the biology of the cell we're confronting, and we know what it eats, and we can kill it. So if most cells obtain energy for fermentation, then what therapies might be effective, right? This is what we're going to go after. One strategy is you talk, try to get rid of the fermentable fuels. All right, so one of, the, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to try to, we have two primary fermentable fuels here. We have glucose uh, that everybody knows about, and then we have glutamine that a lot of people don't know about. It's, it's all in the literature you just have to know about. So we know we have, to, we have to target two fermentable fuels. So we're going to go after the glucose first. So how do we do this? Well, we can do calorie restriction, water-only therapeutic fasting, or ketogenic diets. You got to maintain, uh, 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 you have to maintain minerals. It's not a form of starvation. You have to keep this, these kinds of calorie restrictions and ketogenic diets have to be balanced. Uh, what they do is they lower blood sugar, the, one of the prime fuels for the cancer cell, and they elevate ketone bodies, which, which are a non-fermentable fuel. You need a good mitochondrial respiration to get energy from the ketone bodies. Also, when you do this, normal cells undergo mitochondrial biogenesis and increase their oxidative phosphorylation, but the tumor cells can because they have that fundamental defect. So this is the strategy. We've got a lower glucose, and we have to elevate ketone bodies. And you hear a lot about these ketogenic diets. Um, you know, you have to be careful. There's some that work, some that don't. There's a lot of different things. We don't have time to talk about the differences in the diets. Basically, it's a low-carb diet. It's a high-fat diet, moderate protein. It generates a lot more energy per gram. And as I said, they, they really, this ketogenic diet, I, I, I feel bad the fact that we have to call it a diet. As soon as anybody talks about a diet, everybody goes nuts and it's like confused. It's a medicine, all right? A ketogenic diet is a medicine, and it's like any medicine. If you, if you don't know how to use the medicine appropriately, it may not work, and you gotta know how to use it with the right medicine. It has to be restricted. If you take too much of it, you get insulin insensitivity, and you have all kinds of other issues. So you really have to know how to use the medicine. The key strategy is just, okay, tumor cell needs glucose to grow, nobody denies that. Any tumor cells do. Um, you lower the blood sugar. Lowering the blood sugar is lowering the fuel for the fermentation capacity of that cell to get ATP. Without ATP, nothing lives, right? So you got you have to know how to challenge the ATP in the tumor cell. The ketone bodies are designed to replace glucose. So our normal cells can burn ketone bodies. The brain burns ketone bodies, right? So the tumor cells can't burn ketone bodies because they're mitochondrial defect. I'll present a lot of evidence. I've already done it. I'll present more. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to transition the whole body away from a, from a ferment, but we're going to take them and bring them into a therapeutic ketosis, which puts large, marginalizes the tumor cells and puts them at risk because they can't use the ketone bonds. So we do, in order to help patients know when they're in therapeutic ketosis, we developed this glucose ketone index calculator. We published this, this for brain cancer, it works for any kind of a cancer. I know a lot of people who just want to be buff and strong use the same index just to get healthy. But it's the ratio of glucose to ketones in the blood. And we did a lot of um, uh, studies on this, and we think we're not 100% sure. The closest to 1.0 or below is when you're in a state of therapeutic ketosis, so where your body is burning predominantly ketones at the expense of, uh, of glucose. Anyway, we're doing some really nifty things to push those blood sugars. Once you, once you can get the body in therapeutic ketosis, man, you can pull those sugars way down. And that puts tremendous stress on these tumor cells. 
Now, one of the first studies that was done was done in children, actually, with brain cancer by Linda Nebling and her colleagues in Case Western Reserve University. And they took two hopeless cases. It's a tragedy. If you read the original paper on this, it really it's a, uh, breaks your heart to see what they've done to those little kids. Radiated and surgically mutilated them. They did all kinds of things. All the children were considered hopeless. Um, they were considered not to live very much longer. They were not responsive to standards of care. Linda was able to rescue them and put them on this ketogenic diet. Both children responded remarkably well. The quality of life increased dramatically. Unfortunately, one of the little children brain was so damaged they had to go into special education. But they, they were certainly, they had a much higher quality of life and lived much longer than they were expected to live. And one child was lost to follow up, so that's how effective it was. No one followed this up. We read the paper, we said, what's going on here? We, this was to check, check it in our, in our brain cancer models. So we, we did a, a calorie restriction first, and then we did restricted ketogenic diets, and we, we corroborated what Linda Devlin said, and we provided molecular mechanisms for how all this stuff is working. So here you can see a couple of mice. That's the standard high carbohydrate diet unrestricted, and the other the standard same diet restricted by only 40%. And we can get a 65 to an 85% reduction in the size of the tumor just by cutting back on the calories. And I said, what is going on here? What's, you know, what's the mechanism by which this is working? So we started looking at levels of glucose and ketones in the bloods of these mice. And each square on this, on this chart, it was published in the British uh, Journal of Medicine, uh, British Journal of, of Cancer. The, the, um, each square is a mouse under a different dietary condition. So we used a linear regression analysis. Uh, glucose is the independent variable, and either ketones or tumor weight is the dependent variables. So you can see as blood sugar goes down, the level of ketones go up. This is an evolutionarily conserved adaptation. Because we didn't always have food when we, were, when we were existing as a species on this planet. We have evolved to start, and, and mice too, and other animals as well. When you cut down the food, the blood ketones will start to be made from, uh, from dietary, from fat in our body. But you look at the other side, the right side, as blood sugar goes down, the size of the tumor goes down. The higher the sugar, the faster the tumor grows. The lower the sugar in the blood, the slower the tumor grows. We were the first to do this, is now been replicated in human cancers, brain cancer, breast cancer, variety of cancers. If you want your tumor cells to grow fast, make sure your blood sugar is high as it can get, right? If you want you to, to exit this planet fast, get those blood sugars up. Now, why when you go to oncology clinics, you give all these kids ice cream and cake and all this kind of stuff in these oncology clinics, don't they see the data from this? It's it, it just like, the, it, you can publish all this stuff, but it has to be translated into, into clinical application. So what are the molecular mechanisms by which calorie restriction and restricted ketogenic diets work? They're anti-angiogenic, and as I said, they can slow down the tumor somewhat. Uh, through the, we did the signaling pathways. They're anti-inflammatory. We know inflammation drives this. The microenvironment inflammation drives cancer, and this, we target that. And it's also chromatonic, interestingly enough. So there's no drug they can do what this, what this uh, metabolic therapy can do. And now I'd like to talk about glioblastoma, because this, you know, this is a real toughened up the crack. And um, so we're, ch we're challenging one of the more uh, unmanageable, incur the so-called incurables, uh, among the most aggressive of all primary cancers. And we heard children can have this as well. It's just not as common in children as it is in, in adults. Uh, the, 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 the prognosis is extremely poor. There's no effective therapies. And you know, we just lost Senator John McCain to glioblastoma. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. But um, composed of multiple cell types, the GBM, has more than one kind of cancer cell. It has stem cells rapidly proliferating and has these mesenchymal and highly invasive cells. Um, they invade through the secondary structures of share, which are a, a variety of different ways these cells can maneuver through the brain. They are metastatic outside the CMS. A lot of people don't know that, but they are. And malignant brain cancer has now replaced leukemia as the most common form of cancer death in the United States, but maybe in part due to the advances in managing now we look through the brain of a person who dies from a GBM, and you can see, you know, this very nasty, inflamed uh, microenvironment uh, uh, where the tumor was. But you can also see a major midline shift. The, the, the tumor grows and causes the midline to shift. Most of these patients die from intracranial pressure as the result of the, of the growing tumor. The, the problem is, even in the normal appearing parts of the brain, you can't see the tumor cells. But they're all there. They, go, they use the Vierkau Robin spaces of the bloodstream. They use the blood vessels as kind of a railroad system to maneuver through the brain, and along with a variety of other uh, secondary structures. So the darker cells that you see there are tumor cells growing around blood vessels. Now, we also know that the mitochondria and glioblastoma and many other malignant brain cancers are abnormal. This has been re 
repeatedly seen in electron microscopy analysis, histological, not most of the electron microscopy. Now you see the normal section of a mitochondria given the stripes. Those stripes are called cristae. And those cristae contain the proteins and the lipids of the electron transport chain. We know in biology, if people study biology, structure dictates function. This is the commonality of biological science. Structure dictates function. You look at the, the mitochondria from the, from the GDM, you have crystallosis, the breakdown of the crystal. The very structures needed for respiratory function are gone. Okay, well how is that cell living if the very structures are abnormal? Right? It has to ferment because the, it, it can't respire. It's in a hypoxic environment, the, the mitochondria are defective. Dean Peterson from the Johns Hopkins has never found normal mitochondria in any type of cancer. They're either abnormal in the numbers, the structure, or the function when you analyze them from tissues, from tissues. This is sometimes different from what you see in vitro. So, what we know is mitochondria defective. That means they must ferment. If you can't respire, you must ferment. What do the cells ferment? They ferment glucose. They get the glucose lactic acid fermentation. Glucose comes into the cell, goes down the empty myohoff pathway, produces lactic acid, but all the metabolites needed for rapid tumor cell growth. The same molecule can go down the pentose pathway, providing uh, ribose phosphate for nucleotide synthesis, and also a powerful internal antioxidant system. So they are, have an internal antioxidant system as the result of metabolizing glucose. Glutamine also comes into these cells. The amide nitrogen is used for DNA and RNA synthesis, and glutamate then enters into the mitochondria or is dumped outside to cause the microenvironment inflammation. But it also can generate massive energy between mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation, dumping succinate out as a waste product. So, what's driving the beast is two fuels glucose and glutamate. There are no other fuels in the microenvironment in sufficient quantity to replace glucose and glutamate. They can ferment other amino acids. The problem is it's a logistical issue. So, let's look at what the standard of care is for brain cancer throughout the world, okay, not just in the United States, this, is, this is, happens everywhere. Okay, so we have a poor individual who comes in, he has a headache, he has a seizure, he has something like this, do his PET scan or some sort of scan, and then you see, uh, oh, you have, a, you have a tumor. So we have to immediately resect the tumor. We create a great big wound in the brain as a result of trying to pull this tumor up. Oftentimes you can't get the whole tumor. Then within a short period of time, we begin the irradiation process, right? So, the glutamine and glucose cycle, the glutamine and glutamate cycle is very tightly regulated in the brain. We break all that apart in our attempt to manage the disease. So, we free up massive amounts of glutamine and glutamine, causing this tumor to have access to a very key fuel for its survival. Because the brain swells from radiation, we give high dose dex dexamethasone, a steroid, which then makes puts the patient into hyperplasemia. Okay? So, the two very fuels that I just mentioned to you is, is allowing that cell, that, that those cells to survive, are created by the very treatments that we use, and we throw in temozolomide, which is also a toxic alkylating agent that even makes this microenvironment even more inflamed in the body as well. So what we have done here is we created the perfect storm. A lot of these cells are infected with human cytomegalovirus, which actually facilitates the use of glutamine and glutamine, right? All right, so what have we done here? We've created a perfect storm to allow that to occur. And if we look at the data, this is just one data, a group of data done from Stu's uh, analysis. Uh, it's very important that you look at this, these numbers very carefully. So, in other words, let's look at the red line. The red line are those poor souls that were radiated, right? Not a single survivor in this line. Not a single survivor, right? The other group, the blue guys, were the ones that got radiation and temozolomide. There was a slight improvement in uh, progression-free survival. And that was like, considered one of the biggest advances in brain cancer research in 50 years, that little blip. Temozolomide. Uh, and then, and to be reported, temozolomide increases driver mutations. How do you give a drug that increases driver mutations and you get a little better overall progression for survival? What are the adverse effects of temozolomide? Diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, fatigue. All of these are indirect forms of calorie restriction. We wrote about that, okay? These are indirect forms. Of, what, what is the probability that that blip is due to an indirect form of calorie restriction? He's going to do a controlled experiment to test that. We have a problem in science today. It's a big problem, especially in cancer research. Many of the papers that we publish in the top journals can't be reproduced. This has been a crisis, right? Can't be reproduced. You do all this work, work in science, and maybe the next plant can't reproduce a lot of this stuff. One thing that's completely reproducible is the survival rate of this. This is reproducible all over the world. People don't survive, very few people, if any, survive from the treatments that we're doing. All right? There was a paper that just came out of Canada, in, in, the British, in the British Columbia, Canada. They reevaluated survival from neoplastoma. 
And they found that when you really look at the data closely, it's, the survival is woefully similar to what was found by, by Bailey and Cush in 1926, almost 100 years ago. Eight to eight months to 14 months survival with real plus nine. John McCain survived with 12 months. There's no advance in 100 years. How many times are you going to beat the dead horse before you realize what you're doing is not working? Right? There's a crisis here. Now, let's look. This is Brittany. Now, this was a tragic situation. She was a young girl from Northern California who was diagnosed with a low grade tumor. They went in, and within a month, it turned into a glioblastoma. This is an example of inflammatory oncotaxis, taking the lower grade and making them higher grade just by screwing around with them. So what they do is they give her the standard of care. And you can see, and then she says, well, I don't want to go through this anymore. She's really suffering. You can see her on the right there. It's moon face. Moon face comes from overdose of steroids. Then she writes this article in People magazine, I'm going to take my own life. I'm going to go to Oregon, where they have death with dignity law. And she dies with dignity. Uh, can't see it here, but it was in the same year, 2014. So, with her family, she threw the towel in on the standard of care. Now, what does that say about the profession that you're working in, right? Well, your patients have to take, take uh, death with dignity rather than go through the continued treatments. Not good. Not good. And here's Pablo. You sit here. You know, I don't often have the opportunity to show pictures of people when they're sitting in the office. And some people say Pablo doesn't exist. Pablo's there. You, want to, you can ask him. So he contacted me away a while ago, the same year as Brittany, same, same 2014. And I sent to him the send that I sent to all the cancer patients a, a, a procedure that you can use metabolic therapy. And you know, I, I didn't know. We, did, we give it to all the patients. And, you know, you give it to everybody. They go, I don't charge any money. I don't do that. I give this stuff to Delta. So we didn't know what happened. So um, we didn't know if Pablo was alive or dead. And then all of a sudden we see this thing on a British newspaper, you know, this guy, Pablo Telly, decides to not use any standard of care. I went to the students and said, hey, look, Pablo's still alive. <laughs> this is great, you know. So, um, but in any event, you know, he, he didn't want radiation, he didn't want, he didn't want anything. No surgery, even, which is really why wow, Pablo never had GDM in the first place. You know, he had kind of every kind of a thing that weasel, weaseled the way out of the reality of the situation. But he did have a, uh, the, the, the tumor developed. It was diagnosed as that, and he's doing really well. He's back there. You can, and you can see this was June 2018 when he did it to another another organization. But he's still going. And um, let's look. Why why would someone survive that long if you don't do standard of care? I think, and I'll show you more evidence of, 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 of what we think is happening. I think it's radiation, man. I tell you, I don't avoid that radiation if you have these, these kinds of tumors. Now, we decided to work harder on this. We in order, to, in order to advance a field, you must have the correct tool. We spent 20 years trying to find natural glioblastomas in mice. Mice don't get glioblastoma very often, naturally. It's fun. We found one, and we capitalized on this, and we found a couple more. We started to wonder what kind of cells are in these mice, natural glioblastomas, and in your competent. Well, these, these other mice models people use, a lot of them are bogus. You've got to have the real, the, real, the real McCoy on these things. So this rep, these tumors replicated all the natural growth characteristics you see in your GDM, and we were able to engineer the cells to be bioluminescent so we could follow their migration and invasion throughout the brain. So the right tool will bring us to the right therapy. So we began to look at these mice, and we began to treat them with metabolic therapy. So on the left, you see that the, uh, uh, the tumor growing uh, through the brain uh, very rapidly, using this goes from one hemisphere to the other. That's why it's very, very hard to control. Uh, on the right is we gave the mice calorie restriction or restricted ketogenic diets. And what we were able to see very clearly is a massive reduction in invasion. Uh, but we couldn't kill all the tumor cells. We threw everything at these guys. And we couldn't stop those damn tumor cells from growing. But we stopped their invasion with calorie restriction, restricted ketogenic diets. Then I said, what's keeping these guys alive? And the other fuel, of course, is glutamine. And we knew these were invasive kinds of cells. So we, we looked at this drug called Don. It's, it's uh, 6 diazo 5 oxo l leucine It's a global inhibitor of glutaminases, all right? So it blocks the first committed step of using glutamine to enter. The, to enter. So we use this, and, and it stops TCA cycle at uh, substrate level phosphorylation. It also stops DNA and RNA synthesis. For, and it's a good drug. It's a love dirty drugs. Dirty drugs hit more than all these pharmaceuticals. They want to make one thing a patent and make a lot of money. You've got to have a dirty drug. It's many, many things. That's the way the AIDS, AIDS cocktail works. 
So we set up a hypothesis. If we kept them a ketogenic diet restricted to lower glucose and then donned the target glutamine, we should be able to destroy and kill these tumor cells, and we should be able to kill any kind of a tumor cell because they're going to use either glucose, glutamine, or both of them. There's nothing else they can use. If you take away their fuel, they're going to die. So we decided if we, if, we, if we take away glucose, we're going to shut down and make them vulnerable to make, uh, oxidative stress because we're going to remove their antioxidants. People say cancer cells are resistant. They're resistant because they're fermenting. Fermentation prevents them from being killed by radiation and chemo. That's the reason. So if you remove their fermentation, the that was now they become vulnerable. But you want, to, you want to kill them without toxicity. That's the key. You've got to kill them without toxicity when they harm the, the rest of your body. So the glutamine comes in, and the glutamine, the two of those fuels are going to drive the energy metabolism in these cells. So if we can shut down those two, two outlier fuels, we should, and transition the whole body over to ketones, we then can specifically target and kill tumor cells without harming the rest of the body. So we set up an experiment to test that in our model system. We put the tumors into the brain, let them grow for three days, so they're raging GBMs. So we want to make sure every mouse has a raging GBM. Put them on a, 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 a fast to get them, their bodies all synced, and then we give either the high carbohydrate diet back as the control group, or the ketogenic diet restricted, and then we pulse with on every couple of days. Bing, bing, bing. So we have them under the diet, we're hitting the glutamine. We stop the experiment at 15 days because the whole control guys are dying. All right, so you have to stop the whole experiment so we can then compare and contrast. So here's bioluminescence ex vivo imaging. We take the brains out of the mice, we put them in a dish, we add some luciferin, and the, the light is indicating how many living tumor cells you have in the brain. So you can see how bright the high carbohydrate diet is. The ketogenic diet restricted, that's still bright. We stop invasion, but I told you, we can't kill the cells with the diet by itself. When we used the diet with the dawn, we got many mice that had no light in the brain, all right? No light in the brain, which was quite normal. Now here's an example of individual mice. So the guys on the left, the keto, they all had light, the restricted the ketogenic diet, they all had light. The guys on the right with the diet with on, they only had one mouse that had a little bit of light. All those other bars, they're, they're all background. They're not any light. We did the statistical analysis, and you should see highly statistically significant reduction in the light in the brain, indicating living tumor cells in the brain was massively reduced as the result of the combined diet and drug. We also made a remarkable discovery. When you administer the drug with the ketogenic diet, you get two to three times more drug on target than if you administered the drug with the high carbohydrate diet. This is amazing. You've seen it in another kind of drug as well. Ketogenic diet is facilitating drug delivery to the tumor. Therefore, you can lower lower doses of the drug and get more killing effect just by administering the drug with the diet. Can you believe this? Unbelievable. Then the, the gold standard of knowing whether or not you have cancer is histological analysis. You've got to look at the histology of the brains of the animals that you're treating. So the guys on the, on the standard diet, uh, unrestricted, ketogenic diet, restricted, and the restricted with the diet, with the dog, with the drug. Look at the, 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 the unrestricted, high carb diet, the cells are packed, growing, they can't grow any faster than they are. Massively invading the white part of the brain, growing vigorously. The ketogenic diet, restricted, stops the invasion. You can see the white part, that means there's less invasion. The cells aren't proliferating as rapidly, there's more spacing. But when you did the diet and the dawn together, we slaughtered those cells. Massive necrotic death, mitotic catastrophe. We slaughtered them, consistent with the absence of light in the brain. Then we did survival analysis. And you can see the guys on the high carbohydrate diet, they're, they're checking out in about 15 days. The diet by itself, you know, you get a little bit of uh, progression free survival increase. The drug by itself, you get a little bit more. It's only when you put the drug and the diet together that you get a longer term survival. The animals were pretty, pretty healthy. We're, we're extending these out even further. We then tested another. This is a stem cell kind of brain tumor. This is the CT2A, which I showed you was responsive to calorie restriction. But we couldn't kill. We could never kill by the diet along all the different tumor cells. But when you put the diet together with the dot, this is a highly angiogenic tumor. So you see a big red blood vessel there. Ketogenic diet is anti-angiogenic. We remove the blood blood vessel, but we still don't kill the tumor cells. We slaughter them when we put the drug and the diet together. This is mitotic catastrophe, another way of these cells are dying. And this is a different kind of a cell. This is a stem cell tumor. The other one was an invasive design. I can kill any kind of a cell. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. If the cells are fermenting and you take away the fermentable fuels, checkmate. So based on this evidence, we put it together. A con how are we going to do this in the clinic? How are, we going to, how are we going to possibly institute a new form of cancer therapy that's going to help people? 
we developed this press pulse concept with my colleagues, uh, Joe Marone, uh, uh, George Hugh, and Don Diagostino. We call it press pulse. It was from Paleolithic studies in, in our history, Paleolithic biology. The, we had eradication of mass extinctions on our planet only when two unlikely events occurred simultaneously, which was a chronic stress on populations coupled with an, with a, uh, with an acute uh, pulse, which would lead to mass extermination of organisms. We took that concept and we put it together for cancer, uh, cancer therapy called press pulse. So the first thing we have to do is we have to remove uh, and re remove inflammation and reduce fermentable fuel, which is ketogenic diets, ketone supplementation, stress management. I don't have enough time to talk about how we have to take patients and remove uh, emotional stress is very important. And then we pulse with glucose inhibitors, with glutamine inhibitors, and with hyperbaric oxygen. We think hyperbaric oxygen can replace radiation because it creates oxidative stress. If we do it the right way, under the right conditions, those of time and schedule, I think we can eliminate a lot of radiation with the use of hyperbaric oxygen. And maybe other, maybe ozone, I haven't tested ozone yet, but I plan to. The goal here is to gradually degrade the tumor, all right? We have a patient who comes in, he's all full of cancer, he's got, he's got all kinds of problems, and also they're metabolically disabled, they have a lot, a lot of problems. You can then gradually remove the tumor cells slowly into its managed state and possibly resolution. I don't want to say that would resolve cancer, but we can bring a patient to a long-term management possible resolution. Those such timing and scheduling is a key. And it was just a gradual uh, removal of it. You have to do it so you don't harm your immune system. And that's what we know how to do. We're, we're learning to do it. Immune system, we need to move the corpses. So we've got to be cognizant of the fact that we have, we have to spare our normal immune cells while killing the immune cell that is the cancer cell. So this is what I'm saying. This is a strategy behind all this. Now we try this in, in, a, in a preliminary form uh, on this patient from Egypt that we published recently in uh, Open Access uh, Frontiers in Nutrition. This guy, him and our colleagues in Alexandria, Egypt, worked on this fellow. He was a young man. Um, he came in with his whole left side paralyzed. He had all kinds of metabolic issues. He had tri elevated triglycerides. He had vitamin deficiencies. So they put him on a, on a water only fast for three days uh, and then a very low ketogenic diet calorie. And they did a weight craniotomy to bolt the, the tumor. And he went right back into. Um, ketogenic diets, then we gave him chloroquine and EGCG, which are mild inhibitors of glutamine. They're not major inhibitors of glutamine, but they can do a little bit because we couldn't get done. And then after three months, they, they forced this poor guy into, into standard of care, radiation and, and temozolomide against our record. They, the guy's doing fine. Why do you want to radiate him now? Oh, we have to do that. All right. But he handled the radiation, and he did pretty well through this treatment. And then once he followed that, uh, we then put him back on the metabolic therapy with hyperbaric oxygen. And he was doing really, really well, up to 24, 25, 26 months, even 28 months. Only recently, the last couple of months, he complains of, of, of headaches and things like this. So they did a, a, a compression, decompression surgery and took tissue out of his brain. And um, they found out that he was suffering from massive radiation necrosis damage. They, they didn't find any tumor cells. I haven't seen the pathology report. I don't want to say anything. But the poor guy just passed away like, two weeks ago. And he lived 30 months, right? So I'm saying to myself, well, how long could he have lived if we didn't do the radiation in this guy? What the hell are we doing the radiation for? Because everybody has to do that. It's insane, insane. So we measured his blood, we had his blood glucose down. You can see the correction of the, you can see the correction of the midline shift. You know, the guy was doing really well. I kept checking out. I was like, yeah, he's back working in the cornfields. He was a corn farmer. He's out working in the fields now. Comes in with a headache. And then they gave a massive dose of, of steroids and the poor guy despite it. So anyway, here we have the, the situation, right? I don't want to consider any cancer terminal. I don't like even the term terminal. There's possibilities that we can rescue some of these people. All right? There's a possibility. We have two examples here, right? Brittany and, and Pablo. Right? How many people are going to be like Pablo? I don't know. But the fact that we have one and we have more than Pablo. Is that there's Scarborough and we have Allison, uh, Allison Dannon, we have a couple of others that are out there. Um, they're trying, I'm not saying we get rid of all that. We have to do surgery. I'm not, I'm not against surgery. I think radiation and chemo is, is, is forget about it. What do you do with radiation? Just stop the two yourselves. We'll take away the fermentable fuels. All right. Cancer is a type of mitochondrial medicine. It's not a genetic disease. Get over it. Get over it. This misunderstanding. But the origin of cancer has led to the suffering and death of tens of millions of people worldwide. It will be recognized as one of the greatest tragedies in the history of medicine. 
Cancer cells rely on substrate level phosphorylation for their growth. If you restrict glucose and glutamine, they will not grow. Okay. There's no other fuels in the microenvironment that will keep them going in sufficient quantity to drive the beast. The press pulse metabolic therapy is a non toxic, cost effective strategy for the management and possible resolution of all or most types of cancers, right? I, don't, I think it's just a matter of time before this strategy makes most other cancer therapies obsolete. You want to kill the tumor cell without harming the body. This is one of the strategies. It has to be worked out, though. There are a lot of issues associated with it. I don't want to make it sound all you about. No, no. Those are timing and schedule. I'd like to acknowledge the people who have been supportive of what we have been doing, all my colleagues in the United States, our group in Istanbul, Turkey, the German guys, my friends in Germany, Venezuela, Hungary, I work with Christos Chinopoulos, one, one of the leaders in the field of mitochondrial substrate level phosphorylation, our colleague in Greece, France, Egypt, India, and now in China. My book was just translated into Chinese. Uh, we're working with groups in the traditional Chinese medicine. And finally, I'd like to thank the people who support our work. Tra Travis Christopherson's Foundation for Metabolic Cancer Therapies, Dr. Joe Mercola, George New Foundation, CrossFit, Greg Glassman and the CrossFit organization, very excited about this. Joe Maroon, neurosurgeon, team surgeon for the Pittsburgh fo Football Steelers, Ellen Davis, Boston College Research Fund at my own university, and in the past, the NIH, and thank you for your attention. So this is really exciting. I think you know it's it's absolutely important to draw attention to this microbial and cytoplasmic function. And um, what I would like to try and tempt you to comment on is whether we could have a a, a, a synergy between genetics and mitochondrial changes, and whether it, it might not be a, it, it might just be a head and neck problem. You might have mitochondrial changes first, but you could also have genetic changes first. And if you could perhaps comment in the light of genetic predisposition, predisposition of cancer on that role of, of mitochondrial changes. Yes, this is a point that's very uh, very important. Because it would appear that some people inherit genes that cause them to have cancer. And you'd say, well, the, the, the gene mutation must be the cause of the disease. It's called penetrance. Penetrance means that if everybody that has that gene mutation doesn't always cause cancer, because that's the primary cause. And we, have, we know that there's no cancer gene known that is 100% penetrant. That means we have people walking around on the planet that have the very mutation in the, in the, in the, in the gene, the pathogenic mutation, that's present in a lot of people with, that do have the cancer. So what I have found in my research, the people who get cancer from inherited mutations like D53, D53 damages the electron transmission. Now, why do some people who have that pathogenic mutation not get cancer from a P53 pathogenic mutation is an interesting question. But you will not get cancer unless the mitochondria become damaged. If you have an inherited mutation that does not damage the mitochondria, then it cannot be a primary cause. The primary cause of the disease is the mitochondrial damage that could come as the result of the mutation from the gene. But because no gene is 100% penetrant, we cannot look at any gene mutation as being a primary cause of cancer. It's a secondary cause, just as would be for radiation carcinogens or something along those lines. So it's a secondary cause. Now, that doesn't mean that, okay, so, but then they can come back to the therapy. So if the mutation causes the mitochondria to become defective and the cells are fermenting, you still have to take away the fermentable fuels to kill them, right? So that's, that, that, that becomes a still, the therapeutic strategy doesn't change. It's just that there's our understanding of the origin. And why this is so important is because once we can uh, uh, divorce our cells from this notion that it has to be a genetic primary issue, we can't 100% focus on how to really manage the disease because we're chasing things that are really not prime to the, to the origin of the disease. And that's the point. And that's going to be the difficult pill to swallow for the majority of individuals that are currently working in the cancer field. Yes. So 
Did you just say goodbye and leave the president? We just have a from health. And I uh, thank you very much, Thomas. And I think it's very, very interesting that we actually have methods right now to do a very big difference, to make a very big difference. And we have metabolic approaches, both uh, from the side of nutrition, uh, we have something that you are already, already implementing with targeting uh, um, relaxation and different kinds of um, things that are also targeting glutam glutamine and glucose in people that are stressed. Right? Because we cannot do um, th uh, uh, healing without that. So we, have, we need the metabolic food pictures, we need some programs uh, because the methods are there. We need actually a very practical implementation. Um, so we need new programs that can ensure that we have practical compliance. Because what the people are dying of, they are dying of non-compliance. They are not dying because ketogenic diet is not good or whatever. What are your... Uh, yeah, well, I think the compliance issue for metabolic therapies needs to be uh, addressed, obviously. But compliance is also an issue with chemotherapy as well. A lot of people don't comply with it because it's too toxic. So <coughs> compliance uh, uh, cuts across all kinds of therapies. And you're 100% correct. I mean, we, we, that's why the press pulse uh, strategy is designed to eliminate cancer cells within a reasonable period of time. Because it, it, it's hard for people to adapt a certain kind of a diet ri ri rigorously when everybody else in the environment is not doing that. So there's a lot of issues that underlie the issue of compliance. But I think we're always going to be confronted by compliance issues, regardless of what kind of strategy that we hope to use. And I agree with you 100%. We need to address and make compliance much less of a problem than it, than it currently is. And once we put together the entire package, I think we're going to be able to facilitate compliance. I agree. You have a long list of people who are working with, um, and that suggests that there is a, a lot of patients being treated under, under the scheme. Um, so, when you only gave an example of two, how many, how many people are you currently treating, and how much traction are you getting with no doubt strong opposition? Yeah, yeah. I don't know about strong opposition. Most of it's they just ignore it. Um, if you go on the government, government <coughs> uh, health center, clinical, trial, clinical trials .gov, in the United States, they have this website. There are, there are about, I don't know, 50 or 60 trials on metabolic therapy. None of them are being done the way I just outlined. Okay, so you, well, here's, the, here's the situation, right? So we're going to do metabolic therapy now. Maybe what I'm saying could maybe have some effect, right? So we have the traditional standard of care, which everybody is the control group. Then we have standard of care plus metabolic therapy as your experimental group. But you're missing the key control group. Metabolic therapy without standard of care. Nobody's doing that. Who's going to step forward and pay for a, tri a trial like that? Where are the volunteers like, where are the pioneers like Pablo Kelly who, who want to risk their lives to say, I don't want radiation, I don't want chemo, I want metabolic therapy. Well, we can't allow you to do that in our current system. The IRB, Institutional Review Boards, will not allow that experimental group. So we're up against those kinds of issues. So until we can get the right control group, so then we're not going to know. So I publish case reports where I have a out of that. The design of the case report is to serve as a prototype for people who might want to do larger. And then we say, we've got to get 100 people in here to do it. We can't believe it unless we have a, a, a double-blind crossover trial. That's a, that's a cop-out. People want to live, you know? I've shown you the data for that. You go down that other path, you're not going to live. So, so, so you have to then say to yourself, well, how are we best going to do this, right? We can't, the physicians aren't trained. They don't get this kind of training in medical school, how to do metabolic therapy. So the very people that are going to implement the therapy themselves lack knowledge on how to do this with concepts. They can learn quick, but they have to, but then they, they have to be approved by those in the group boards to do the right control groups. So these are the obstacles <coughs> right now. So, so I think once we overcome all that, yes, there are a lot of people being treated. Yes, there are, just like we heard, a little bit of statistical evidence that it doesn't, there's a hundred studies, ketogenic diet doesn't harm you. Uh, Christ, I think they read the literature of the epilepsy for 50 years. We've been treating children with ketogenic diets for more than 50 years. Ketogenic diet's not harm you, unless you go out, unless you do it some strange way. 
But you know, the bottom line is well, it has to be proven to be non toxic compared to radiation and chemo. Are you kidding me? So, um, you know, this kind of nonsense. The, the, the issue here is it will work if you do it the right way, if you have a knowledge base that knows how to do it and moves these patients through the system. Does it work on everybody? No. I think we have compliance issues, and I think some people are just, for whatever reason, resistant to it. But will it help with your other people? I think it will. For everything that I've seen, I can't publish everything that fast, right? I'm doing the best I can. You know, I teach biology at Boston College, and I know I've got to write this case report. So, um, but we write the case reports because each one will give us new information for the design of a larger trial. That. Pa Pablo, you'll be hearing from Pablo, he's, he's telling us a bit about him himself on Friday. Um, his initial diagnosis was that the tumor was too large and he was given a very short time to live. After almost two years of the diet, as the Professor Seafield is saying, it had shrunk to the point he could have surgical resection and he was taken out. He had surgery but no radiation or chemo. So that was quite interesting. Eric and Marie Blythe from Fire Medical. Thanks for what was a really interesting presentation. And just a quick question, but it, it seems this has a much lower side effect profile than conventional treatment. Can you comment on any negative or adverse effects at all? Yes. As we learned from our children with epilepsy, you can have constipation long term, um, which I think is an interesting one. Um, I think bone density issues for long term, like kids that are on ketogenic diet for several years to manage seizures, they have bone density. Sometimes you have to manage the, the minerals and nutrients. Very important uh, to have electrolyte balances corrected when you do this. You just can't jump onto some of these diets. You need medical, you need a med medical blood work uh, to monitor your blood while you're doing the diet so you can tweak your system, your physiology, depending on how your body responds to that. So, yeah, so you can have. Um, constipation, you can have um, bone issue problems, you can have a few digestive issues, but um, nothing, your hair doesn't usually fall out and, and you don't suffer from all kinds of other things that we know. Thank you. 